Thanksgiving, chapter 1, you're going to find the beginning of heaven, earth, uh, water, darkness, angels, cherubims, you're going to find all that. Um, that one took place in Genesis 1, and it's not mentioned uh, as far as the angels and cherubs aren't mentioned there. You'll find light is mentioned, the firmament, these are all beginnings, plants, all the plant life, sun, moon, stars, all that. Animals, man, woman. Uh, you'll find the numeric system. Counting, one, two, three, four, five, that's universal throughout the world. That's because Genesis 1 established that. It at least got the first six numbers, then Genesis 2 got seven. Then you go to Genesis 5, you get eight and nine. That's where counting started. Uh, then you have covenants or agreements back in Genesis. Then you have beginning of religion or nations. Uh, you have beginning of sin in chapter 3, beginning of apostasy. And in Genesis 3, you get your first strife that takes place. First um, problem, first fight. Genesis chapter 3. Uh, death is introduced in Genesis 3. Uh, government, uh, about Genesis 9. Languages, Genesis 9. The different races, Genesis 9. And so you find all these beginning things, uh, sacrifice, Genesis 4. So that's all at the beginning. And in chapter 3, God reveals uh, the basic approach to strife. Okay, strife, fight, arguments, and stuff like that. He find, you show that in Genesis chapter 3. So I'm going to run through some of that. So Genesis 3, uh, if you would, pick up about verse 8. Okay, so Adam and Eve had already... Uh, ate something they weren't supposed to, and uh, so they sinned against God. And chapter 3, verse 8, God is the initiator here. He's the one seeking them out. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And man is doing that ever since. He hides, he hides from God. He tries to drown out God. Tries to ignore God, and if he does take an interest in God, he wants to put him in a box, leave him in a box until he wants to take him out and use him. And it says, verse nine, and the Lord God called upon Adam, said unto him, Where art thou? Okay, now he knew where he was. Omnipresent, omniscient, he knew. But there's a reason why God makes people say certain things. Okay, not makes them, he wants them to. Uh, verse and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. So Adam heard it. I was afraid. Okay, and this is a typical reaction. Often if you bring up the Lord God or about Jesus Christ to people, you'll see a fear comes across their face. It come, you can see it in their eyes. Okay, and that's the reason right there. Okay, they're afraid. So he was afraid because he did wrong. He said, because I was naked, I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? He knew the answer. But Adam needed to say the answer. And there's a reason for that. Okay, and then verse 12. Now, if you want to hold your finger here, put a marker there. I want to come back to that in more detail later as we get going on this idea. But God here in verse 12, 13, 14, specifically, even down to 19, he's going to show uh, the basic approach to strife. Okay, a parent can use this. Okay, when you got uh, your kids and they get in a fuss or a fight or something and you weren't there, so you got to figure out who was right and who was wrong. Or if the kids have a, dis when they get up in there, they just go, there was this way, no, it was this way, it was this way, it was this way. And what we would do, if one would say one thing, the other said the other thing, my wife and I would usually say, okay, okay, here's the, okay, he's right, he's wrong. And then the one who was wrong, we say, now say it. I was wrong and he was right. They hated that. But they needed to do that. And there's a reason for that. God does the same thing. When uh, Peter betrayed Jesus Christ three times, three times he had to say, I love thee. Three times. There's a reason for that. Okay, and it's, it's a release of guilt. It's an admission of wrong. That's necessary. 
Okay? If they say, I love you makes good three words for a good marriage. No, I am sorry is another three words that's good marriage. I was wrong. Another set of three words that helps in that situation. Okay? And then that's followed up with, okay, I love you. Okay? So he's going to show us our basic approach to strife here. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, uh, Paul said, If it be possible, live peaceably with all men. Okay, that's the ultimate goal. Live peaceably with all men. But you know, some folks just don't want to live peaceable. <laughs> okay, and there's reasons for those things. In Proverbs 26, verse 17, he says, He that meddleth with strife that belongeth not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Now, I didn't say scratch behind the ears of the dog. It said take it by the ears. That means you grab it by the ears and drag it. If it's a big dog, you're going to get bit. If it's a little dog and you're holding it in the air by itself, it's not going to do anything. <laughs> okay, that's why you want a big dog. Okay, and so uh, you're going to get bit by a big dog. And so when you get involved in strife that doesn't belong to you, you're going to get bit. Especially if it's a domestic abuse or a, a dispute in a hillbilly environment. <laughs> it's like... They'll fight like cats and dogs with each other, but if you get in the mix of it, they're going to turn and fight against you. And that's where you just got to lay low. You know, Madariville area, over in that area, you kind of got to notice those things. So, but the idea is stripe. Now, Paul said this in Philippians 2, uh, verse 3. He said, let nothing, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. So when he throws that, let each esteem others better than themselves, the idea there is in verse 5, humility, pride and humility, uh, pride is going to be the, the fuel on the fire of strife, and humility tries to dispel it as best as possible. And so I'm going to give you some thoughts, a couple of thoughts this morning about strife. It's a basic approach to life. Um, several years ago down in Rensselaer, some kids got in a little argument, fussed back and forth, and my wife got involved, you know, and trying to figure out who's right, who's wrong. Now that time she tried muscle testing, which it helped in this situation, where she asked one kid, make the statement, okay, and then she put his hand up, and then she pushed it down, okay, you're lying. And then the other one made the same, okay, and the arm stayed strong. Okay, now tell me what you did. <laughs> now, I don't think that works in all cases. It's kind of a lie detector test. Okay, but still the idea is as far as our basic approach to strife. Okay, circumstances in your life often mold your character and attitude. Okay, and... Uh, it's how you react to that is more what molds your character. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time here and tell a little bit about stories in my life. You know, I play like a fundamentalist for a while, but I'm not the hero of my stories. Okay, and, but, you know, it says in Philippians 1, 6, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Now you look back in your life and... Why do certain events stand out? I mean, you've got a lot of experience, but there'll be certain ones that really stand out. And I think that's the Spirit of God who is enlightening your will, saying, pay attention here. Get something out of that. Okay, now, uh, my upbringing, of course, on the farm, you know, I was a fat little baby. But then I lost all the baby fat and turned into a little runt. If we, if you had pig litters, I would have been the one to throw them out. <laughs> okay, so I was a little runt growing up. Now, some folks, I've heard them say, they remember some things at three years old. Does anybody remember things when you're three? I never, did you? Okay, not me. My best recollection was, uh, recollection was uh, kindergarten. And what I remember about kindergarten is sitting in a corner. I sat in the corner a lot. You know, not a naughty kid, just energy. And so, hey, the corner became no problem with me. And I remember one kid in class got stuck in the corner and he started crying. Oh, what a big sissy. You know, <clears throat> he grew up to be a sissy. And so, <laughs> uh, that's all I remember kindergarten. First grade, there's uh, two or three things I remember. I'm sitting in my little seat, you know, girls in front of me, Joan and Brenda's behind me. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm just sitting there minding my own business and I thought I heard Niagara Falls break out. 
And I, all of a sudden, Niagara River, Yellow River is heading my way off that, that tile. <laughs> she peed herself. <laughs> so on that one, that one really got me. And that one, I learned a lesson in life. Go to the bathroom when you need to. Okay, so the next thing in first grade I remember was Mrs. Schrag. She was the teacher. And uh, she wanted you to eat everything on your tray. Every single thing on your tray. And you could not leave until you ate everything. But we thought we were smart. We could stuff it in our milk carton. And when you take it up, she grabbed the milk carton and shake it. And then, oh, what's this? Oh, man, I, I learned there, you don't fool adults. You can't get away with that. And so as soon as finally Mrs. Schrag would, she would eat like a bird. And when she finally got done, she would go up, take her tray, and all the ones that didn't want to finish her plate, man, then we would all hit the thing. We'd get right up from there and get out of there. But um, that, that taught me some things about, hey, these adults are pretty smart. Uh, second grade. I didn't learn a whole lot of second grade except that Mrs. Childress, I thought she was a grandmotherly type. And the reason why I don't remember a lot of second grade because about that time I got hit in the face with a baseball bat. And now you know what my problem is. Okay, there's uh, farmers that uh, we knew over in uh, Boone Grome area, uh, Chuck and Lois Kubel. They had two sons, Carl and Larry. Carl was Ronnie's age. Larry's a couple years younger. Larry's a very good athlete. And Larry was swinging a baseball bat, coming around, and I was standing right behind him. And I didn't know what hit me. And I woke up halfway to the house, then I woke up about two hours later, and my face was, you know. And so I don't remember a lot of second grade. Now, I learned from Carl and Larry. Larry was my hero. Well, I liked Larry. I admired Larry. His dad, Chuck, was my Sunday school teacher all through high school. And Chuck even taught his Sunday school class when I was the only kid in the class. He, was, he still taught his class. We usually had two to six boys. And I remember Chuck's faithfulness. But one time, Ronnie and Larry, they always got to team together. I, Carl got stuck with me, the runt. And of course, Ronnie and Larry, good enough athletes, they would always beat Carl and I, and I would start crying like a little baby. One time Carl said, cut that out. And I never did that again in my life. I learned from that. Why do I remember that? I think the Lord's teaching me a lesson. Third grade, I got introduced to smoker's breath. I didn't know anything about smoker's breath. Uh, my teacher, when she said, turn in your math book. Oh, why has she got such a deep, deep voice? Well, a smoker's breath. I learned that when I'd ask her a question and she'd breathe on me. I was, smoker's breath. So I learned not to ask questions. I learned to figure things out on my own accord. In that class, that's the first time I got a D, first and only time I got a D in history class. And I was kind of looking forward to getting out of third grade because smoker's breath, you know. And guess what? Fourth grade, they moved her up to fourth grade. So I got smoker's breath for two years in a row. And so I was really getting excited about going to fifth grade, and they moved her up to fifth grade. But fortunately, they split the fifth grade classes that year, and I got to go with the sixth graders. Well, I was happy about that. Well, I had Mr. Aiken was my teacher for two years. He was my first basketball coach. Now, as my first basketball coach, remember, I was a runt. I was about four feet, nine inches tall. Man, I mean, that five, six kid, he was big. I was short. And when you're short, you can dribble a basketball both hands. No problem. I mean, it's so low. Them big galoots, they can't dribble a basketball. And so he would give us these glasses where we couldn't see the basketball, dribble right hand, left hand. We'd play tag. Now, the rule was, in order to tag the guy, you had to have control of the ball. Them big galoots couldn't do it. I'd be sitting in the corner waiting for them big dudes to come to me. I'd go back and forth. Hey, can't get me. Well, as a point guard, you become the leader of the team. You're the quarterback. How do you do that four foot nine inches tall? I can't be a bully. Well, I can do punching on a kneecap. I learned to be a quiet leader. That's what I learned. The principal, Jack Foss, even told my dad, he said, now watch him, he's a quiet leader. I, I mean, you're not smart enough to manipulate people at that age. And so that's what I learned in 5th and 6th grade. 7th grade, the only thing I remember in 7th grade, pretty much so, was my woodshop teacher was weird. 
He wore purple shirts. Just strange. I found out after high school when I first learned about homosexuality, which I didn't know anything about, all through growing up, not a clue, that my dad was instrumental in getting that dude fired. Because he was that way. Uh, hmm. Well, then I found out after high school there were three kids in my little elementary school boys that chose that lifestyle. And all my experiences with them were hmm, sissified. And then I found out a couple guys in high school. So if people say I'm a homophobe, I have a reason for that. All my experiences are bad with that crowd. I mean, it is a very eerie feeling to be whistled at by a male. Go to Pendleton State Penitentiary, played basketball when I was in college, getting whistled at. That don't sound real good. So for me to be a homophobe, I gladly bear the title. No problem. It came about for a reason. And so these things kind of develop in your life. When I got in ninth grade, big whopping five feet two inches tall, Okay, when I entered ninth grade, two thoughts came into my mind. And one was, enjoy high school because it's going to go fast. And I did. And the second thought was, when you have a problem, a zit right here, don't worry about it. Everybody else has the same problem. We would call those lighthouses. I never really got one there. My friends did, but boy, they'd get a big one right there. Right there. You got a lighthouse. <laughs> okay, and so... In high school, I, I remember that, but there's another thing happened in high school to me where I had a friend named Mark Hansen, and he liked to fight. I could not understand that. Of course, when you're 5'2", five, 5'6", five, when I got my license, 5'9", when I was a senior, 3 inches after high school, I mean, you're short grown. Why do you want to get in a fight with somebody? I could never understand that. We're walking out of uh, school during lunch hour, and people, it was a nice warm day, and he said, I want to get in a fight. And there's uh, Wayne that I played basketball with. He was goofing around. He pushed somebody and he fell backwards into Mark. And Mark says, let's put it up. And they got a big fist fight right there in the spot. I could not get that. Why do you want to fight? You went to the principal's office. You got suspended. I mean, you get busted in the face. Well, in his case, it might have improved it. I don't know. But those, those things developed some things in my character, in my thinking. And you know, you have experience where you look back on, and that's God, because God is interested in everybody's life, and He's trying to mold your character. Now, how are you going to react to those things? You're going to learn from it or be a victim of it? A lot of people become victims of those things. And with that in, in my life, you know, I'm thinking strife. You Man, I... Hey, when you're short, you try to live peaceably with all men. All they got to do is take your fist and boom, like that and you're done. I was taught karate by a guy who was about 6'4", and that's what he would do. That's, he'd get in a sparring match, he'd just come, boom, and the head would, and the guy would pass out. Okay, and so, what do we got strife going on? Well, it's introduced in Genesis chapter 3. And so, what do you do when you kind of come across some of those things? Well, the first thing you do is you try to avoid it like a plague. Proverbs 26, verse 19, or 17, says, He that meddle strife that belongs not to him is like one that taketh the dog by the ears. Now, Proverbs has a bunch of ideas on this thing called strife. Uh, 15, verse 18, A wrathful man stirreth up strife. Okay, so maybe that's a guy in the job. He's always looking to cause a fight. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Okay, so he's telling us there, you can appease strife by your temper or controlling your temper. Uh, 16 verse 28, it says, A forward man stirreth up strife. And a whisperer separateth chief friends. Now that one, that would be a good verse for the news industry. Because that's what they do. I can't stand the news industry. 
And uh, one time I got asked to be interviewed by somebody. It was something going on in the past. I said, I ain't answering any questions from people like you. Unless you write it down, and then I will put my written down answer down, and you have to record every word that I write. Because they will twist everything you say. And the lady wrote down, what is your name? <laughs> and that was it. That Never had to deal with that one. Why? Because they're forward. They stir up strife. Uh, 17.1, it says this about strife. He said, better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Chapter 20, verse 3, it is an honor for a man to cease from strife. But every fool will be meddling. That's a good one. 28, verse 25. So he says here, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. 29, 22, an angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. So obviously the, the great writer here is telling us first and foremost, if you can, with all cases, avoid it. Stay away from it like the plague. If you see somebody else getting it. When I was in Colorado Springs, we would knock on doors and try to invite kids to ride a, a bus. And I'd be going from, you know, apartment house to apartment house. And I'd get ready to knock on some door. I could hear some screaming going on inside. Mom's yelling at the kids. So I'd just stand there and listen for a while. And when it got to the point where I thought she's getting ready to smack the kid, I'd yeah! knock on the door. Right in the middle of an argument. And they'd come, oh, hi, how are you doing? How's things going? You know, and then I'd try to rescue the kid, you know, and then I'd try to bring him to church next Sunday. But, you know, that's common. It's like the little kid said to his dad, he said, Dad, what's a weapon? He said, something you fight with. He says, Mom, your weapon? It's sad. Where's that start? Genesis chapter 3. That's where that starts. That's the end result of sin. Okay, so avoid it. Okay, another thing is, is I'd say we've all experienced this. You ever been experienced on a highway? You get a big traffic jam and there's an accident. Okay, and people just love to gawk at that. It just annoys me to no end when you got nothing on this side of the road, the accident's on that side of the road, and why do you get a traffic jam on this side of the road? People gawking. And they want to see the strife or blood. The thing to do is move on and pray for the people involved and go on. Don't stop. Don't slow down. Just keep right on. Now, obviously, somebody in front of you is going to be slowing down. Okay, so you don't want to hit them. But the idea is when you see strife, start praying. Start praying. And now in Genesis 3, if you're... To get involved, police officers, I tell you, have a tough job. Can you imagine being a police officer being called in on a domestic uh, conflict going on? Oh, what a thing. And you've got to come into something blind, and you've got to try to figure out who's lying, who's telling the truth, and they're both usually lying, and what's going on here, and you've got to try to figure this thing out without getting shot at. Or anything like that. Or a police officer comes in on an accident. He's got to determine who's at fault, who's not at fault. Man, that's hard. And they're not going to bat a thousand. Jen and I and Brent and uh, Jen and uh, little Gabby was just a little one. She's probably, I don't even know if she was one yet. We were traveling south on 231 between Hebrew and Damat, we was getting right by the road where we'd turn left to go to my, where my grandparents used to live up that hill. I forget what that kind of road that was. But we were going to make a left-hand turn there, and there was a truck coming our way from the other direction. It wasn't a semi, it wasn't a trash truck, but it was a big truck, a dump truck. And I I'm, I'm got the left turn signal. I'm going to take, uh, take that left turn. But you know, I don't trust anybody. I peeked in the mirror before I made that left turn, and I saw this car squalling through there this way. And then there's one right behind me. And if I would have made that turn, we would have been head on with that. He would have pushed us right into that truck. We would have been gone. That would have got all five of us at one shot. 
And so when I quickly saw that, when I saw that coming, I hit the accelerator, pulled to the right, hoping the guy would squeeze through, hoping just to make it through this thing. And the guy right on my tail hit me right in the rump, and he just pushed us up a little bit. And that other guy squalled right through and didn't touch anybody. I mean, the guy that actually caused the trouble came through it without a scratch. Well, fortunately, he stopped. And everybody was all fine, so I checked that everybody was all fine, and I got the two drivers together. I said, okay, now here's the story. Here's what we're going to tell the police. I didn't want three different stories. I said, when the officer comes, here's the storyline. And I, tell you, I said, do you, either one of you have a problem with what I just gave? Not at all. So the officer came, made his job very easy, told him what took place. Okay, and the reason why is, I know how those things work. This guy says this, this guy says this, he don't have a clue. And so I put it all down on one story and saved the officer a big headache, hopefully. Saved me from getting stuck with the insurance bill, too. <laughs> okay, but can you imagine being a police officer coming into a domestic abuse or dispute? Unbelievable. And then come into this and sometimes get shot. Or they come in an accident. When they got an accident, a two-car accident, you got to deal with two people, three-car, you got to deal with three people, multi-car, you got to investigate everybody. So here's what God does, Genesis chapter 3. Notice what he does. He knows there's a strife taking place, gone on. And you have to know this, right off the bat. Verse 11, he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Okay, now he's doing that for a reason. He wants to make sure, he wants to see if he's going to confess. The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Who did he blame first? He blamed God. Woman, you gave me. And often when you get involved in that, guess who are the fingers gone? And you got to know that. And God knows that. And you notice God ignores it? God is amazing. He's so gracious on these things. He could have right on the spot said, You dirty dog. He just ignored it. The woman you gave me. Now this is standard operating procedure. Pass the buck. Okay, so man first off tries to hide from God. And then when God shows up, he tries to pass the buck. So Adam blamed the woman. God didn't say anything, so what did he do? He went to the next step. Okay, so if one sibling blames the other sibling, you talk to this one, you go to the other one. So he goes to the woman. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So what's his next step? Okay, let's go to the next step. The Lord God said unto the serpent. Now notice he doesn't have to get a confession from him because he's not going to confess anything anyway. He says, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field upon the belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So God made him bite the dust. And a little snake in the grass. And so then he says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman. So now he backtracks. So he goes to the woman. He says, Okay, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. Nobody's changed that. Still in effect today. Then he goes to Adam. He said unto Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is a ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And nothing's changed that. Came from dust, we're going back to dust. And that's what this little kid asked his mom one time. Mom, I learned in Sunday school, we came from dust, we're going back to dust. Is that right? That's right. I looked at my bed, somebody's under there, either coming or going. I don't know who that is. 
Okay, so now what takes place between the dust is what God's interested in. So we can see God's pattern. Okay, went to Adam. He blamed Eve, went to Eve. She blamed serpent, serpent. He got his punishment, came back to the woman. She got her punishment, came back to the man, got his punishment. Now it was necessary. Why? Because the punishment appeases our guilt. It appeases it. It takes care of it. It's, it is a psychological thing. Okay, several years ago, there was a gal down at Rimsel Talk area. She lied about me to a police officer. And there was another party involved. So the, 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 the authorities took those two situations and they brought a charge against me for practicing, and let's see, the unauthorized practice of law. Okay, so they were saying that I was pretending to be an attorney. And I'm like, why would I want to do that? Okay. I would lower myself. Okay, and so, uh, so I got this charge against me, and I, you know, fought on my own without an attorney, and they had they dismissed the case. Okay, two three years go by, and that gal called me up. She says, "I want to tell you, I'm sorry." Oh, and I said, "For what?" That's important. She said, "Well, you know." I said, "Well, I don't know what you're talking about." For what? For what are you sorry? Well, you know. I want to hear it. I didn't say that to her. I said, are you apologizing for lying about me to a police officer? She said, well, I was mad. I said, oh, is that how that works? When you're mad, it's okay to lie to a police officer about me. Well... I'm sorry. I said, if you're asking forgiveness for what you did, apology accepted. I forgive you. Now, I didn't do that for my sake. She needed to do that. And God wants us to do that. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is, Lord, I was dead wrong, you are right, and I'm asking you to forgive me. And it's done. Isn't it a wonderful deal? It's done. That doesn't matter before or after salvation. It's done. It's set, sealed, signed. And if you bring it up again, God in heaven says, who are you talking about? But we often bear this guilt. If you bear guilt for past sins that's been confessed, that's the devil trying to defeat you. If you bear guilt for present sins or sins unconfessed, that's God trying to help us get right. So that's the pattern. So the idea is the Lord is telling us, investigate all sides. Listen intently. Pray for discernment like Solomon did. Pray for discernment. And this is the basic approach. Okay, another thing we need to keep in mind is be considerate. Okay, and understanding. Why? Because there's a strife within each and every one of us. There's a strife inside me. My old nature and my new nature. This is why people fight in war. It's because our members inside are fighting. And so, when people fight, yeah, a person be self-righteous and all that stuff. Man, I got the same problems. I have a hard time keeping myself straight. Let anybody else. And the thing is, we just understand that. Traveling down this road of life is, is no different than traveling down the highway. We're traveling down the highway, you've got to make constant adjustments. And if you don't make constant adjustments, you're going to end up in a ditch. And you're going to make mistakes in the highway. And I don't care if you've driven for 400 years, you're still going to make mistakes in the highway. And the thing is, you just hope and pray that when you make that mistake, it doesn't cause an accident. And so, we just want to be vigilant in life. And we want to understand, hey, but by the grace of God, that could be me. And then Jesus Christ, one of the Beatitudes says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, obviously, doctrine, that's a millennial passage. It's a whole different time period. But still, there's a general idea that if a person is a peacemaker, where they're trying to reconcile two parts, in essence, in essence, you're... Behaving like Christ Jesus. Because what did he do? 
There's one God, okay, and there's one mediator between God and man, and that mediator is Christ Jesus. But when Jesus was on the cross, people drove or walked right by him, gawking, just like a gaper's block, and didn't even consider him. And mocked him and made fun of him and blamed him. Okay, and so the Lord Jesus Christ is such a, an example, an amazing thing, is that he is the atonement. The word atonement or at one meant where two parties are at odds, and the two parties as God and man, we're at odds, and the Lord Jesus Christ wants to be our peacemaker. And he wants us to get us together. And how does he do that? Well, he died on Calvary. When a person places their trust in Jesus Christ, that bridges that gap. And then now you are at peace with God, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not baptism, not church membership, none of that is through Jesus Christ. That's the deal. And so here, way back in Genesis chapter 3, when God gave a basic plan, what was the remedy? He had a sacrifice right there, and then Adam and Eve took the lambs, the, the um, hide of the lamb that was sacrificed, and they put clothes on to cover their nakedness. And that sacrifice was a temporary atonement for them, okay, until the blood of Jesus Christ clears us from all sin. And that's the offer we have today. I mean, this world's fighting and it's not going to quit fighting. People fight and fuss, not going to stop. The Lord Jesus Christ is the peacemaker. He's the one that can fix it. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to follow the patterns that you have that uh, yeah we're going to try to avoid strife but when we get involved I pray you'd help us to, to uh, handle things properly investigate ask for discretion help us to have peace Lord I pray you'd help us to, by your grace if we get in that position uh, police officers that have to put up with these things it's amazing Oh, we know they're not all good. We know that. But boy, what a job they have. And I pray by chance if somebody here this morning is not born again, they're not saved, they're not at peace with God, that they can see their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the peacemaker. He's the Savior. And they come to Him, trust Him by faith, and be at peace with God. Well, heads about and eyes are closed. The piano will play. If you'd like to use the altar, it's open for you. The wonderful thing of, even for the believer, we confess our sins. God does not need us to do that. We need to do that. And when we do that, then God cleanses us from all sin. Man, that, that is something. We don't have to live in guilt. Sure, a person can apologize for wrongdoings and try to make it right with another. Sure, we can do that. That will help rectify the situation. But as far as God is concerned, when that is confessed properly, biblically, He hits the highlight button and hits the delete button. And it's done. Thank God for that. Lord, thank you for a blessed book you've given us. And Lord, thank you for uh, showing us how, in Genesis 3, how to uh, properly uh, try to help in, in a strife situation. Lord, I just thank you for your words. Appreciate it. Love your words. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Okay.